Okay, we're back. Uh, we'll get straight into it. Um, so over to our guests to introduce themselves and to tell us something about where they are right now. Hi everyone, I'm Dale Southerton and I'm currently at home, which is just outside of Manchester in the UK. Dale, can you tell us a bit more about what you do? At the moment, I'm co-director of an ESRC centre called the Centre for Socio-Digital Futures. Do you want to know more? Yeah, a bit yeah. more, a bit more on your okay. research. Well. Yeah, so the, the centre is really, uh, it is what it said it is, so, so digital futures. Um, one part of it is taking the idea of futures in the making quite seriously. Um, and so we do lots of research on how, on claims about what futures are going to be and how those claims are acting in the present. Um, that leads us to think about practices because practices are performed, they happen in the present. Um, they always have a past and a, a future, but what those pasts and futures could be are completely you know, open, I, I guess. Um, so we have a set, a set of what we call domains of socio-digital practice. So that uh, I think places like the home, consuming, um, schools, learning, and so on. So... Um, so that we're, there's a whole range of things that we're doing there. I'm particularly interested in the consuming futures, and I'll say a bit more about that, I guess, as we as we move on. Cool. Okay. I'm going to hand over to our resident pirate, Natalia. Yes, hello, Dale. Um, so, I'm particularly interested in your precious practice theoretical ideas, but before that, I want to hear a little bit about your history of practice theory. And I would start with a question, when did you first encounter practice theory? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, mid 2000s, so back to, I would say 2004, maybe, um, that I first encountered practice theory as written as practice theory. I guess that quite a lot of the ideas that are practice theory I'd worked with in one way or another, um, quite quite a lot with Elizabeth actually. Um, back when I was started doing my PhD, so I, I had an interest in food and kitchens. We also did some stuff on things like freezers, caravans, all sorts of wild, wacky things. Um, so we worked with quite a few of the ideas that have come to be um, key, uh, I think, in, within practice theory. But it was probably around the mid. 2000s really through my my work with Elizabeth and with Alan Ward at that time and then we introduced uh, rec fits and so on and I think you know if I was to look back so we I could recast say Elizabeth's book on comfort cleanliness and convenience as a book on practice is but I don't think you wrote that as a practice theory book Elizabeth but yeah no. so that's my answer Wonderful, like exact year, almost exact year uh, when the when the first encounter um, happened. Um, and what attracted you to practice theory? Oh, I mean, loads of things, really. Um, I, get, I mean, one thing that I think important about practice theory is it kind of thinks of change as a set of processes um, that are always about reproduction as well as alteration and modification of, of things. So that was kind of important because Particularly back in back in the day, I sound really old now. I am quite old now. Um, <laughs> back back in back in the early two thousands, there was quite a lot of stuff about um, how the world is changing in, in radical ways. So through postmodernism and so on, and really led through culture and those kinds of things, which I kind of didn't really find that convincing, and was particularly interested in the more boring, ordinary stuff and that actually quite a lot of day-to-day -day life is just continually reproduced. There's a fantastic book by a guy called Evertor Zara Babel um, called Hidden Rhythms. And I think it's almost like the first line in the book says, you know, the most remarkable thing about contemporary society is how little it changes and how ordered and regular it is. And I just, that's always stuck with me because that's kind of, you know, we look for change. And I think practice theory is brilliant, actually, at holding together these tensions and dynamics of change. So that was one um, reason. I mean, creeping normalization. So going back to the sort of uh, mm -hmm. Elizabeth's work and so on. That I mean, that I think for me is, captures that idea of 
change. I think uh, as well, one of the things that um, attracts me to practice theory is it takes stuff seriously in a way that um, very, very few. I mean, it links into STS. STS maybe takes, in some encounters, takes stuff too seriously. So I think what's really good about practice theory is it does take stuff. It takes stuff in multiple forms. So um, infrastructures are really important. And that, I don't just mean wires, there's a whole range of different kinds of infrastructures. Things are, are really important as well. Um, but it, so it takes stuff in, seriously, but it doesn't, if you like, lose culture. It still has ideas around conventions. And it also still holds space for social relations. So it recognizes differences and variations and so on. Um, and also allows for ideas like rules, rules and procedures and so on. And I think those are kind of, in my, in the world that I live in, those things seem like the most important things. Um, and I, so it gives us a nice conceptual framework for holding those things together, depending on the questions you ask and so on. So I think it gives you a lot of flexibility, it gives you a nice framework with a lot of flexibility. What else? Um, it allows you to deal with habits and routines in, in, in a more um, satisfying way, I think. So that's one of the reasons that, that I've been interested in practice theory. So outside of practice theory, a lot of the accounts of habits and routines just slip into automation and addiction of some description or another. And that's just not OK. I mean, that's wrong. Um, and I think practice theory gives you um, better con concepts of thinking about how things are reproduced in particular forms and so on. And then finally, um, the critique of individualism that's embedded in practice theory. So it, the practice theory doesn't deny or delete individuals or people from its analysis, but it doesn't reduce everything to those individuals or the aggregate sum of those individuals actions or thoughts or beliefs and I think that's um, fundamentally important for the kinds of questions that I ask yeah that's why there's a few reasons <laughs> indeed and moving on to the present uh, currently what practice theoretical ideas are you working with so yeah at the moment that well, I've been doing some work thinking about activities and how activities connect together in time or with time um so trying to take the ideas of activity chains and activity events and look at it through time use data um yeah so that's one area i could talk a bit more about that but I've, there's a podcast somewhere where, where i talk a bit more about that um through the center i'm really interested one of the i've got a number of projects one of them is about um Future making practices of future making and innovation that happen within British BT British Telecom, which is really quite interesting. So things like this might only make sense to people who are UK based, um, but BT has a huge infrastructure. It's got an incredibly interesting history, um, which I won't go into. But at the moment, there's all the green boxes, which used to be the telephone exchanges that were in at the end of people's streets. That's now redundant because they've gone from car, uh, copper wire um, to send signals around the world to tiny, tiny, thin um, fiberglass. So, so they've then repurposed their, those green boxes to electric vehicle charging points. Now, I'm quite interested in how did that kind of thing happen? What practices go on within BT that make that seem like a good idea? And what solutions do they think they're solving? And what effects that they think that will have on different kinds of practices? Now, they obviously only think in terms of mobility, but I think there's wider sets of connections. That's a small part of a bigger set of projects, which is looking at how BT think about futures and think about future practices. So they have a showcase, what they call the showcase, um, and a whole innovation ecosystem, as, as it's called. Um, the showcase, I, I would love to take Elizabeth for a walk around the showcase. She would find it fascinating. In there, there's the home. And the home hasn't changed for sort of 20 years because the home has reached saturation in terms of innovation. 
okay, which is crazy when you think about what happens within homes. So this is a, a home which has a you know a sofa, a dining table, two giant screens. That's the innovation. Um, a kitchen that's never used, never actually used as a part of the exhibit or as part of the everyday lives that are placed within them. So what's really interesting about that that whole process, and they've got the bank and they've got the streets, and uh, they've got all sorts of different um showcases different different spaces is what gets assumed to be not changing the mm -hmm. routines and the habits and the ways of life that are just completely taken for granted is always going to be present into the future and what does change and it's not just that it's the same practices with new technologies there is a kind of an assumption of that practices will change but perhaps not in the way that that um well, in a particular kind of way. So that's an interesting project. And then we're trace, tracing how the ideas that make up these practices that are, that are placed within the showcase, how they how they emerge across the organisation of BT, which is a big 100,000 people employed, um, does lots of R&D and so on. So that's, that's one project that I'm working on. Um, and then the other sort of main one is around the television. So I'm kind of interested in TVs. So TVs as in TV watching or the watching of content that could be on a TV. So you might not be watching it on a TV. Um, so I'm interested in that because I do quite like following objects around, as, 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 as you might know. And some of the things I've done in the past, so well, yeah, I've done, done washing machines and, and freezers, um, but the but the TV is uh, like it's a really big practice. It takes up a lot of people's time. When we did some stuff on activity connections, in using the time use data, and we looked at loads of practices, but we only wrote about three. If you look, and those those are sleeping, eating, and um, reading. And the T TV is one of the most connected. Watching the television of some TV program is the most connected activity for loads of different other practices. So it's kind of there and it's everywhere. Um, it's got a history. So that this sociologically discussion of the moral economy around television, TV scheduling and all that kind of stuff. That, but I didn't, haven't seen much written about television for, for some time. So I'm really interested in television practices, working with, with a bunch of colleagues at, at Bristol's, David Evans and um, Mike Foden. Particularly, um, we've got, I'm really interested in how it connects in time and space. So um, we've got one idea, which is Stevie, Stevie the TV. So if you, anyone watches Friends, there's a, a, a clip in there where guy Joey, say, somebody says to Joey, Joey's a sort of funny guy, um, I haven't got a television. And he looks really confused and says, but what's all your furniture pointed towards? So that's quite interesting. So what's happening in households? We've done a mass observation of, um, directive and we've asked people to send photos from the perspective of their TV. And TVs are still what all the furniture's pointed towards. People still do seem to have a main focal TV, which kind of goes against all of the few, I've done an analysis of future claims of future television watching, which is we will watch TV on our own, obviously, because the world's more individualized through our laptops and tablets and, and phones and, and so on. And you think, well, what's going to happen to the home then? If, if they, those futures are correct, where, what happens to the home? And if those futures aren't correct, what does it mean to have that device that's doing a huge amount of coordinating and connecting, both in terms of the space, the materiality of the home, including the home as controlled in your smart devices and so on. So I think it's really interesting. I could. I'm going to wrap it up because we've only got 10 minutes. Um, so those are the main things I'm working on at the moment. Fantastic. Thank you, Dale. Uh, lots of lots of um, very interesting projects and ideas. Um, but now I will hand over to our resident anthropologist in a special Easter edition. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for admiring the Easter bonnet. Um, but I am I am acting still as some kind of touring ship-based anthropologist. So, but before I come on to that role, I'm curious to know 
what you think your work on the TV brings to practice theory. So you've talked a lot about the other way around, but what 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 developments are you working on in practice theory via the television? Yeah, I suppose I'm, I've not I've not really thought yeah. about doing looking at the television. This is um, you know pretty early stages of a of a project, so I've thought about um the questions are about how how are digital technologies being claimed to shape practices in the home? Um, so that's what we've looked at so far. So what are mm -hmm. the claims that are out there being made? Um, I think what it could bring to practice theory is this idea of, um, I don't want to say futures because it's a bit too flabby and generic as an idea, but it's looking at how claims about futures are being, what claims about futures are being made and what aspects of practices are completely outside of those claims. Mm -hmm. So we've used a, rep, a, a web scraping yeah. tool. Um, uh, and so we looked at, I don't know, about thousands yeah. of, of articles and so on on claims about the future, future of television. And hardly any of them, I think there's one that talks about watching the television together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think of when I look at the mass observation archive directors we've got back, most of the discussion about how people watch television is as a collective activity, mm -hmm. even if that's done individually. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I think that's quite interesting. So it's kind of to think about what aspects of practices get screened out of claims about the future. Mm -hmm. Does that matter? Because I suspect yeah. it probably does yeah. matter a lot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Now I'm going to be an anthropologist properly. Um, so because of that, I'm interested in tribes. And um, I've, I've got a simple question. What what tribes are you part of? Are you working on your own in practice theory land or are you who are you connected with? What tribes? Yeah. What tribes do you belong to now? OK, that's fair enough. I think I think I've got um, a number of loose tribes. If it's tribes related to practice theory, I think they're quite loose. So in the there's one tribe which is in the centre, um, where I would say most people on don't know much about practice theory, but are um, familiar with and draw on theories that would fall under the wide umbrella of, of practice theories. They wouldn't necessarily label them as such in the way that perhaps we would. Um, so quite a lot of STS actor networky type people. So that's quite interesting because they're not the same theories. So there's a lot of tensions that, that we, we're working through. There's a wider community at the University of Bristol who are interested in social practice theory specifically. So I have some connections with them, although I kind of think sometimes social practice theory gets interpreted in slightly different ways and put to, put to different uses than, than, than I would. Um, I'm kind of quite well hooked into group in Norway, so at, in Oslo, in so SIFO in particular, but also the group in uh, SUM, which mm -hmm. is at, at Oslo, once Oslo met, and at Copenhagen University, where I um, do, do various things with people in the sociology department and in the, I think it's called Food, Economics and Resources department, but anyway, they do stuff on food and they're interested in practices and time and temporalities. And then I work a bit work with um, Jen Winnan's on time diaries. So those are my, so I've got sort of three house yeah. tribes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so part of this is about expanding networks and getting to know more people and so on. So where do you think we should go next, us ship of practice, captain, pirate and anthropologist? Well, there's, you could go to, go to Norway. Yes. Uh, go to, um, so, so Arva Hansen would be a good yeah, person. Yeah. They've got they got a nice practice theory group. Or go to um CFO. And they've got some great PhD students. I have to go, actually go and speak to some of the PhD students. So but I'm not going to give their names out without checking with them first. <laughs> That's fine. Um, That's fine. Yeah. Okay on the boat. Or go to Copenhagen, Bente Halkia. She would be yes. an interesting person. She's to talk. on our list already, in fact, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or Christian Fuentes in um, Sweden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice stuff on routines. Yeah, so. yeah. No, we can't go everywhere, and no. we'll we'll take these suggestions seriously. Right. So, 
Next, we've asked you for a souvenir of yes. our visit. Um, have you got one? Yeah, I do. I've got, got a nice one. Well, I think it's nice. <laughs> but other people to judge if they believe. So this is, um, I've got it on my other screen, that's why I'm looking away. This is, so one of, the, as part of the work from the centre and work with BT, I did have a project which was to look at past futures. So what were the futures that were being thought of back in, let's say, the 1960s? Um, and I still would like to do that project, but you just, you can't, you can't do everything. So in the British BT archives, which anybody can access, it's online. If you, we'll, we'll say plain link. Um, they have what it's called the British, the post office telecommunic telecommunications journal. So from 1969, remember BT didn't exist until the late 1970s. So it was the post office. And in this, there's a two page model of um, the perfect town, which talks about um, the telecommunications of the future. And it's got some, it's, you could look at it as predicting the future. Mm -hmm. And it, it's got something that you, we would now think of as the iPhone. Excellent. But it's not, it's not really the iPhone. It's, it's fantastic to look at. It's got a mahogany face. And it, <laughs> And as you read through the the, art, the article, it t it tells you that you know in the future we might need to save as much as many as fifteen one five um, contacts to link into this phone. So the idea that you know you'd have more than fifteen people you or places you would want to contact yeah. on speed dial was was kind of like a radical thing. So it's great because it it the the. The um, article itself captures lots of things that kind of you could think of as having happened, but also misses huge amounts of things that, that, that actually have happened there mm -hmm. around domestic divisions of labour and so on. One more thing on it. The reason why I like this article is that it's actually only a very little bit about future technologies. This is a telecommunications company. So this is about building urban areas. It's about building towns. And it's got... So the model with little plastic cars and people is shown as a picture. The TV viewer, which is kind of one of the king key, key technologies that they're predicting, it's got um, a map of the town that you could imagine, and then it's got the technical specifications of what the networks might look like. So that's really quite interesting because the technical specifications turn out to be completely different. This is not about you having your own personal phone. This is about networking an entire community as a community-based resource. So the whole purpose of this is something that has certainly definitely not happened. So it's really interesting to, to look at that. That's great. So normally we just get an object, not a kind of lecture on how to oh. read the <laughs> object. So that's, that's absolutely great, Dale. But before I let you go, just one final question, because I'm sure our our viewers are really puzzled by this what is in the background what is this black thing on the wall behind you oh this is a uh, treadmill okay end of story and it's Great. only there because we're selling it yesterday and, yeah. 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 So. yeah great dale thanks ever so much and um yeah we'll be on our way thanks, dale. thanks everybody nice to drop in Thanks.